Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much again for this opportunity to come before you as a group of believers, as a church, to worship you and to serve you and to hear your word. Lord, speak through me, dear God, and let your name be glorified in this place. Spirit, lead the rest of the service. Continue to lead it, dear Lord. And anything that comes against your will in this place, let it be declared powerless and be canceled now in the name of Jesus Christ. And may you be glorified and honored in this place today. So we're just going to do a quick recap of what we did last week for those of you who wasn't here. So it's not going to take long. We talked about spiritual renewal and commitment, and we kind of gave this definition of spiritual renewal and commitment is this resuming or restoring a fresh life and vigor to our love and dedication to serving the Lord. How many of you, over time, you've kind of lost your love, you kind of lost your passion, and you don't really study the word and serve the Lord like how you did when you was first saved or when you first rededicated your life and it kind of dwindled away. I know I have, and it's been various seasons in my life where it was more on fire than it was, in a, than it was um, you know. So, and we said, because this was the adult session, so we said renewing and committing your life or recommitting your life to the Lord is almost like a vow, renewing your vows. All right, over time, right? Well, Jennifer, you, you know, you wouldn't know anything about this, but after time, when you get married for a little while, Sometimes the passion and the fire dwindles just a tad. Just a tad, but you don't worry about that. We know Ken is a man on fire. Right? Right, Ken? So, you know, and we, we, we gave some practical tips on how to, to rekindle or to restore, or renew this relationship with, with God the Father. I, I talked a little bit about how me and, the, me and my wife have committed time every Friday. And I think I got myself in, or at least somebody I got in trouble. Because, you know, I'm sure many of you, you know, some wives may say, honey, how come we don't have a date night? So I may have got myself in a little bit of trouble, but I, I, I apologize. All right? So we want to talk a little bit about getting, uh, that's what we did last week, getting to know God just all over again. Sometimes we forget how awesome God is, right? And, you know, like a marriage, sometimes simply just forgets how awesome I really am. Right, Symphony? <laughs> okay, I'm going to get myself in deeper problems today. All right, but anyway, it's all good. She knows I'm a clown. I'm a jokester, so. Anyway, <laughs> practical tip number one that was given last week. It was be intentional about committing daily intimate time with the, with the Lord. How many, if you did not do it on a regular basis since last week, you said, okay, I am going to set aside some time to read my Bible and pray. Anyone did that from last week? Okay, we got like three people. Three people was listening last week, and they say I could do it. The rest of y'all, I'm going to get y'all before the end of the day. All right, practical tip number two. Marvin, I watch out for you too, okay? Pray for a change of heart or desire. David, after his little, his little thing thing with Bathsheba, this is his prayer. It says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So it takes a divine intervention sometimes to help clean up our hearts and give us that desire, change that desire to serve him and to love him. All right? So you just ask him, God, give me a greater passion for you, a greater passion, desire to, to, to study your word. Because sometimes the Bible isn't the most interesting book. Sometimes, depending on what chapter you read, I'll be honest with you, when they have a lot of genealogies, right? If you could relate, say Amen. Uh, boy, boy, boy. <laughs> all right. I with you all. And it says, practical tip number three was remember what he has done in the past. When we get in trials and temptations and rough times, sometimes we so f forget what he did for us just last week, just last month or last year. And sometimes I know I have to do this. I have to go and try and remember. I say, God, we've been through this already before and you delivered me. You did some things that were miraculous. I know you could do it again. So that you have to encourage yourself. What we talked about last week was putting wood on the fire. Remember the altar? For those who are here, God is the one who lit the altar, but the priests were the one who have to keep on kindling, putting the wood and taking care of it. All right? 
Practical tip number four. Read Christian books with testimonies of what God is still doing today. Do not limit your thoughts about God, what he's doing in these four walls or in your four walls of your house. All right, he's doing great things. I love, I love to read books, um, especially about missionary work in like different places like Africa. The amount of miracles and stuff be going on in them kind of places is unbelievable. All right, and these persons are, are, are coming to, to the Lord in vast numbers. And sometimes we need that encouragement. All right? There's a lot of great things. Oh, so much wonderful things I read about and it just boosts my faith. But if you're not reading and, and, and getting to know the things that the Lord is doing and you're just looking at a small circle, you will miss out on what God is doing. All right? We talked a little bit about getting to know His omniscient power. And we mentioned two things, basically. We said that God is all-knowing, and that means he knows things that didn't even happen yet, or would have happened if you had made a choice A versus choice B. Who remembers that? So when God says, if you do A, this will happen. If you do B, this will happen. If you choose A, he still can see the choice from B. And we, we talked about a story of David, which I will not go into right now to, to illustrate that point. And then we said, things that never, sorry, he knows the beginning and end of all things created. All right, he knows when you had hair, and now he knows the lifespan of all the hair that you lost. All right? So everything that we have, everything that he created, he knows the beginning and the end. Isn't that awesome? About the, how many people have ever existed? We have what, about 8 billion today, right? Roughly. So imagine the amount of persons who would have died and he knows everything about them, every speck on their body. He knows the beginning and the end. Isn't that an awesome God we serve? All right. Now, because of you, it's Youth Sunday, I want to talk about a little bit uh, about a king. And his name is Josiah. How many of you know Josiah the king? We have a few. All right. Who can tell me? Let's go back. Who can tell me how old was Josiah other than Natalie? Who can tell me for a lollipop, a blow pop, or a um, ring pop? He was seven. No, he was not seven years old. That's, that's a good try. How many? Yes, George. 18 is a good guess, but it's not correct. Natalie, not you right now. All right. Anyone else? Marvin. He was 20. No. All right. Say it again. 73, no. Yes, little one. Sorry? 16, no. You got a hand up? All right, Jonathan? No. All right, Natalie, man. Thank you, Natalie, from Team A. My team. You know, I see I was more than fair. Because they say I biased because I'm on Team A. Natalie, you can have one of these things here. All right, you, you can get it later. Discrepancy? Oh, sorry. Man, she know, she's, so, she's so smart, she knew what I was going to ask. It was, it was when he became king, he was eight years old. How many of you are around eight years old today? All right, Natalie, again. So, so many of us at eight, at the age of eight, we are not ready to, re uh, to reign a kingdom, are we? But guess what? Josiah was a special king. And he was only eight years old when he became king. Isn't that awesome? Wow. So, I mean, that, I can't even imagine that. Eight years old running a kingdom. Anyway. Um, and this is what they said about him. He was a special king. And this is toward the end of his life. They said, before him, Josiah that is, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with what? All his heart and with all his soul and with all his might. According to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. Now that is something to put on your resume. Right? That is awesome for this young king from eight years old. And God used him in a mighty way. So, no matter how old you are, you have no excuse. 
You could be used mightily to serve the Lord. But there's a criteria here. What did he do in red? Right? He turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might. Everything he had, he dedicated to serving the Lord. How many of you here would like to be like that? How many of you here think you ain't there yet? How many, who there? <laughs> Get the oil, please. We need, some, we need some prayer in the house. All right. <laughs> All right, so we, we went this already. So Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he began to reign. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. So he was in an old king when he died. How old was he? 39. Man, see, y'all shout the answer out. You can't get no price. And he did what was, what? Right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of David, his father. And he did not turn aside to the right or to the left, for in the eighth year of his reign, how old was he? Raise your hand. How was he in the eighth year? Kaylee, 16. George, 16. Okay, two, two, come for me afterward for blow pop. Tell you what, I think I can give Bernard this duty to pass that out so I don't get myself in trouble. All right. And he was 16 when he, what did he do? It's something very significant that he began to do at age 16. No. Look at, let's read this voice. And he did not turn aside for in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a what? While he was still a boy at 16, he began to seek the God of David, his father. Young people, at 16, he began to search out the God of his father's David. Now, his father was not David, just so you know. What does that mean? He was from the line of David. All right? And you will see this in Scripture where they talk about the, you know, his fathers. They go back to significant fathers because David's line was a righteous, he was a righteous king. And then you may see others who say, he followed after the ways of his father, Jeroboam. Jeroboam most likely was not the father. All right? It means that the sins of Jeroboam, he followed after. All right? Let's move on. So the first thing you as a young one need to do, no matter how old you are, is to decide in your heart to seek after the Lord. All right? Just if I put an envelope in this, in this auditorium, this church, and said, this is $1,000, it's under a chair, young ones, go and seek after it. Right? I'm sure you will say, uh, anyway, it ain't under this one. I ain't think I got border. Man, if I put a new iPhone under there, they'll be around here, around here digging up the place in the seat, digging up the cushion. All right? They understand what it means to seek after something. Right? And that is the same attitude you as a young person and not so young person needs to have towards seeking after the Lord. All right? Let's move on. Facebook. All right? If we were to go do a little stock ex exercise on King Josiah, right? That's what we generally do. When we want to find out something about someone, we go on Facebook, correct? And we do a little search. So we go and say, search King Josiah to find out a little bit about his history, to find out a little bit about his family. You know, that's what we do, right? Okay. So I don't lie in church. All right. Let's talk a little bit about his father. Because some of us believe that because of our environment, because of our family, we have an excuse not to seek after the Lord. You know who his real father was, other than David? It says his father was King Ammon. And his father was 22 years old when he began to reign. And he did what in the sight of the Lord? He did evil in the sight of the Lord. So his daddy was an evil man. And he served and worshipped idols. And because he worshipped idols, his peoples, them, his boys, his servants, they came and killed him. Right? So he had a short reign of two years. So he started at 22 and then he died at 24. So he had a two years and that's why Josiah was so young when he became king. Now let's go to granddaddy. Oh, granddaddy. Granddaddy was voice. Granddaddy was King Manasseh. All right? Manasseh, he didn't just do evil in the sight of the Lord. It says he did much evil in the sight of the Lord. So granddaddy was horrible. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord. He rebuilt high places, right? That's where they did Baal worship and, and other gods. That's where they went to worship other gods. 
He built altars for other gods in the house of God. Now that's really some trapsy stuff right there. You, you bring in these Baal idols and, and Ashtarash and whatnot inside the house of Yahweh, and you expect him not to get upset, all right? And he served and worshipped the host of heaven, like the sun and all those kind of things. He, he was really about exploring, right? He was all over the place with other gods. So he served and worshipped the host of heaven. He even burned his son as an offering to Molech, right? So he's burning his sons to the gods, and offer them as sacrifices. And this, he stayed seeing Miss Cleo. He, was, he used to go to fortune telling um, classes. I mean, he used to call up the fortune teller. Um, he used to practice omen and sorcery. So you all think these things would just come about, hey? Uh-uh. And he dealt with mediums and necromancers. Mediums are those who connected with, the, with different spirits, okay? And necromancers were people who called up dead spirits. They, they're kind of different, all right? And guess what? He led Judah, because Judah was supposed to be the good tribe. They were supposed to. But he led Judah to do more evil than other nations. That Remember when they went into the promised land? He said, drive out these nations in the time of Moses because they wicked people. They served all kinds of other gods. But guess what? This same king here, he was considered more wickeder. Is that a word? No, it isn't. He was more wicked than the people who God wanted to exterminate. All right? And he shed much innocent blood. So he was, a, he was, kind, of, he was kind of wicked. This is the line. These are the, his, grand, his father and his, and his grandfather. But guess what? Josiah stood up for what is right. So this is kind of an environment how he was brought up. But he just say, I will not follow after my wicked them daddy and granddaddy. But I will seek after the Lord and live and seek righteousness. All right? Now, how many of you can tell me what's happening in this picture right here? Yes, sir. Yes, it's a Mustang. The muffler did not voice, no. Yes? It, no, it's not running hard. Say it again. No, the engine ain't cooling. Yes, Devin. It ain't smoking. Come on, man. We're my, we're my car enthusiasts. What, what's it doing? It's purging. What is, what is the purging? Nitrous. Why is it purging? <laughs> Jordan, why is it purging? To clear all the bad air of the system, right? So purging is a means of getting bad things out of the system. Because if you don't do that, you could like blow an engine, right? John, you know anything about that? <laughs> but blow the engine from nitrous, no? Okay. Oh, yeah. All right? So this purging is something to get the things that you don't want in your system, and it's generally um, a forceful thing. All right? Now, let's continue with Josiah. Josiah, in his 12th year, how old was he now? No, in his 12th year. All right, we're going to go with 20. Who said 20? Marco, you said 20? I believe that man. I can't even hear what you <laughs> Anyway, remember he started at 8 and then it's 12 years, so he's probably, in the, he's probably 19, 20, like Melanie would have said. All right? But guess what? What he began to do? He began to purge Judah and Jerusalem. What does that mean? It means he, he, he started to get rid of the bad things in the land to cleanse the land. He got rid of the high places where they, was, where they went to worship Baal. Then he got rid of Asherim and the carved and the metal images. And he chopped down the altars of Baals in his presence. And he cut down the incense altars that stood above them. And he broke in pieces the ashram and the carved and the metal images. And he made what? He made dust. That's how bad he beat them. He beat them so bad and crushed them so bad it turned to dust. Right? So this was not a gentle process. It was not like, okay, let me handle this idol. Gently lift it out here, please. And take it out of the temple. No, he got that and he bust that up. All right? Out of that righteous anger to say, I am going to forcefully get rid of these things. It wasn't a passive exercise. All right? He made dust of them and scattered over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. All right? So, point number two for you young people if you want to renew and recommit your life to the Lord, you have to do a purging process. 
No, you don't need to go buy any nitrous oxide. This is purging the sin and idols from your life. All right? The high things, the high places, and people in your life. All right? Those things that have taken high priority in your life over God. The places that we go that have taken high priority in our life. The people. Now, I say violently kick them out. That ain't what I say. All right? It's an it's a inner process where you violently rid yourself. The violence is within you to, to get rid of it, not against the people, okay? I just want you to know that. Make sure that's clear. I don't want you to go to some of your friends and say, I purged you out my life. <laughs> no, I don't want that. All right? But some of us, we have some things, some places and some people where God should be in our life. All right? We have some things in our life. Some of it, many of our young people, it's their phone, right? Because they would be on the phone for, for hours and hours. And if you say, go read the Bible, it's like, I can read it on my phone then. Then they go on the phone and they get bored for five minutes and then go back to doing what they were doing, right? Or places that you know you should not be. All right? This is the place where you should be on Sunday, right? All right. And people who are high in your life and have taken place or priority over God. All right? You know these people do not encourage you to do godly things. You know these people encourage you in the worldly things. Move them out of the high places and put God there. All right? You know what it is in your life. This is just a little personal story. We're having some issues in one of our rooms in the house. And, you know, there was some funny business going on. Um, I don't know, some of you may have some kind of things where, where you hear different things in the house or some weird stuff happened in the room. Anyone ever had experiences like that? And it was clearly a spiritual thing. So we went inside when we prayed, and the God, God led us to, to, to see some things, and there was one funny pamphlet, and it has like the Grim Reaper on it. It's supposed to be a salvation pamphlet, but I don't know, but it gave a funny, it gave a funny um, feel to it. And then we, we went and dig in. We, so we went to seek, because the children couldn't sleep. It was stuff going on in the room. So we went under the bed, started digging up the bed, and we found some books from James Patterson. How many of you know James Patterson? Who read James Patterson? Get rid of them, burn them. All right, or any other books that are dark and that are uh, 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 wicked and evil, anything. You all know, all right? Some of us have some magazines in our rooms that, that, that shouldn't be there, or some music in our rooms that shouldn't be there. Anyway, we gathered up all those books, and I say, told the children, you all want to start a, a bonfire? Oh, yeah. they were so excited. They ran in the front yard on the walkway, dump all those books, and light that up. And it was smoking. They, they, they just had a good time. All right? But the whole thing was we were burning those things that were not clean. All right? Some of us have to do that. Some of us have to take some of those CDs. Well, we don't use CDs much anymore, right? But some of those CDs and books and magazines and Anything that is that's holding you back to the world and stopping you from moving forward, you need to take it and burn it or get rid of it. All right? This is what you need to do to help purge these stuff out. Some of us say, okay, I can put it here and it ain't, I ain't going to listen to it. Right? But then when you get in a, a ditch, then you go back. We have a tendency to go back because these things bring us comfort. Some of these things bring us comfort when we're lonely. All right? Some of us, when, we, when, when you have a little crush, when you, when you have a little relationship and you're going through a rough time, you go to that old song, right? Mm -hmm. You all know. It's going to take some purging out of your life to, to, to renew and recommit your life to the Lord. And it's going to be painful. It may cost you some money. You say, well, man, I spend hundreds of dollars on these CDs. All right, how much is your soul worth? How much is your relationship worth? All right? I remember saying that to someone that she didn't take that too nice. There was this lady, she was asking about a decision, and, and she said, should she do it? And at that time, I think the place was illegal. All right? At that particular time. And I said, I said, if you're a Christian, you want to stand for righteousness, I wouldn't fool that. She said, man, you know how much they paying? I said, how much is your soul worth? Oh, and that cut her deep. 
And she's like, Mom, why you gotta drop it like that? I being serious. All right, how much is how much is our soul worth? Or our relationship? When we talk about idolatry, a lot of us think of serving other idols or gods, correct? Now many of us don't battle with those things today. But when God was reprimanding the people of Israel in reference to the idol, these four things came up. And in essence, this is what I consider to be idolatry. He says, you shall not fear other gods, nor bow to them. This is in 2 Kings chapter 17, by the way, if you want to look at it. Nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. Many of us don't go and we say, Oh, we worship this one, and we worship this God, and we serve this God. However, who do you fear? Who do you fear in your life? Do they have place over God? Because his whole thing in this scripture was saying, Do not fear no God over me. I am the supreme God. Do not fear anybody over me. How many, some of us are fearful, Right? We always blaming Satan for something. We always say, oh, it's the enemy. Or we, we scared of, of the enemy. God said, this is a form of idolatry. If you are fearful and have other, whatever it is, as over God, that's idolatry. You should not fear a lower power. You should fear God. In the second point, now I bow down. Okay, show reverence or honor or, or serve. How many have people or things in their life where we serve or we, we show more respect for them than the things of God? Young people, sometimes we are more concerned about our, our image on Facebook, our image and our friends, our group, our little, what do they call it? Squad, right? We're more concerned about the image that our, our squad thinks of us rather than what God thinks of us. This is a form of idolatry. Or sacrifice to them. Now see, you might think that this talking about sacrificing animals and bringing bread offerings. And initially that's what it was. But you know what a part of the sacrificial process was? Was showing reverence and thanks for your provider. When they brought peace offerings and, and different offerings, it was a form of showing Thank you, you are my provider. How many of us put our employer or different things as high as our provider? Things that are not according to God's will. We say, oh, well, we, 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 we need this as our provider. Okay, God, you know I need this. And he's saying, that's what this sacrifice was all about. They used to go and sacrifice the other gods because they wanted favor. All right? And then God follows it up and he says, But you shall fear who? The Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt with great power and with an outstretched arm. You shall bow yourselves to him, and to him you shall sacrifice. So this was his issue with them. The things that God is responsible for, and we go somewhere else, it's idolatry. All right? If you believe that anything, anything else is your protector other than God, it's a form of idolatry. He's our protector, right? He's our healer, right? He's our provider. These things are what he does, all right? Yes, he uses people in different ways to bring these things. But if we for any one second believe that that is the source, that's a form of idolatry. Now, as we continue, Josiah, he starts to build or repair the temple. How old was he? Now, in the 18th year of his reign, how old is he now? I hear some serious, some out there numbers. 18 and 8 is what? 26, right? And he began to clean and cleanse the land. Now, guess what? While they were paying the temple, they found something very important. What was it? The book of the law. Very good. 
So when he read this book of the law, he realized the things that was in, the, in, the, in this law. And they were not obeying the things that were written. So he went and cried to the Lord. And he said, go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and Judah. Concerning the words of the book that has been found, for great is the wrath of the Lord. So he realized that there was a great wrath upon the people. Because of what? Because they did not follow the law. That great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. And then he went ahead and he read it to all the people. So what did he do? All right. You as a young person are responsible for sharing the word of God. All right. He realized that wickedness or not obeying God's law had consequences. There's a saying um, about a Christian. I said, yo, Christians are so, I can't remember the exact word. They just come and tell people about um, judgment. They just like tell judgment. They'll talk about judgment and wrath of God. And they say, how would it be if we knew of wrath, but, no, not, but did not tell you or warn you? What would you call us then? As Christians, we are responsible for warning the people about the wrath of God. If I have a loved one and I know that they're, they're going over a cliff, would you not warn them? Yes. Out of love, we share the wrath of God so they could repent. And then after all, he made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes. With what? All his heart and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. So, each one of us, if we are not right with God, we have to recommit ourselves to serving him wholeheartedly. Right? With all your heart, soul, and might. There's one more thing. Josiah, he saw after reading the book that there was a Passover feast. And they have not had such a Passover feast in over 400 years. It says since the time of the judges, before the kings, during all the days of the kings Israel, of Israel or the kings of Judah, for no such Passover had been kept since these days. So Josiah restored the Passover feast that was 400 years lost, or was not done according to how it was before. At the age of what? 26. So he made his intention and commitment to obey the commandments of the Lord, no matter how it looked. Many of us, when you talk to your friends, with young people, you say, well, man, these laws from how long ago? This book was written how long ago? You trying to bring back these old, ancient rules. This is 2020. Why are you trying to follow rules from thousands of years ago, how many of you faced with that challenge? That you, you, you try to live a life according to the Bible and people come and say, man, this Bible is an ancient book. This is not applied to today. We about liberal, liberalism, right? Freedom. Josiah stood for what was in past and he did not turn to the right or to the left. Ecclesiastes says this at the end. One of my favorite passages that put things in perspective, no matter what I may do in life. It is thought to be written or inspired by the writings of Solomon. And this is the end of the matter. All has been heard. It says to fear God and keep his commandments. After all Solomon had achieved, he had a thousand women, 700 wives and 300 concubines, right? He had wealth that he didn't know what to do with. He had buildings. He had built things that took him years to build. I mean, his list of accomplishments. He was considered the wisest man on earth. Solomon, the queen of Sheba had to, tr had to travel just to hear him speak. And when she came, she was amazed and she said, they didn't even say half of what it is. You so basically, in, in our words, 
he blew her mind. He blew her mind. It's like she didn't. She thought she was going based on what she heard, and when she got there, it was like so much more. And this same Solomon says, "Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, with every secret thing, whether good or evil. This is the all of my, the whole duty of man." He couldn't look at his wealth. He couldn't look at his wisdom. He couldn't look at anything. It says, for this is the whole duty of man. Fear God and obey his commandments. Now here's the cool thing. Right? Josiah, he became king at 8 years old. He sought out God at 16. He began to cleanse the land at 20. Began repairing the temple at 26. And then he read the book of the Lord, his people, made covenant with God, restored the Passover feast, and served God all of his days. Now here's the cool thing about um, Josiah. About 280 years earlier, his name was mentioned. 280 years before this ever happened, before he ever became king, his name was mentioned. Why? Because God knew him before the earth was ever formed. And his, his being was not an accident. The exact time of his birth, everything about Josiah was known and planned before everything, anything was created. In 1 Kings 13, which is about 280 years before that, Jeroboam, he set up temples outside of Jerusalem for the people to serve God. And this was forbidden. And a man came to Jeroboam and said, by the word of the Lord to Bethel, Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings. And the man cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, so he's prophesying over the altar that Jeroboam has set up in Bethel and he had some golden calves there. And he's offering sacrifices to God against his instruction, God's instruction. Because they were supposed to do it in Jerusalem. So this man of God came and said, O altar, altar, thus the Lord says, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah, by the name. And he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places, who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be poured on you. And as we read, 280 years later, Josiah took the priests who were sacrificing at those other altars and he burned them on the altar at Bethel. And he took some bones and he burned that on the altar. Now, I don't know if Josiah knew this passage. But he was an instrument used by God to, to bring judgment to the house of Jeroboam and Israel. So God revealed his plans, to, his plans for J Josiah over 280 years before he became king. And I want you to know that every one of you here today, God knew you before you was born. He knew exactly what time, what place he wanted to put you. In this century, in the Bahamas, wherever you were born, wherever you end up, he knew exactly where he would put you. You know exactly what day you would be born. No one here is a mistake. Every one of us has purpose. No matter if you were a surprise to your parents. It was not a surprise to God. And he has a purpose. And he has decided, not randomly, but intelligently, I want to put them here. I want to put her here. And I have a purpose for them for this time and season. There's an interesting verse in Acts that supports this. And it says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him 
and find him. Yet, he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. God is not far from any of us. All of our living and being is in him. If we seek him with all our hearts and with all our soul and with all our might, we will find him. Let's close our eyes as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word that reveals to us how powerful, how all-knowing you are, God. That there is none like you. And Father, thank you for your word that shows us how special each one of us are to you. That you took the time, Lord, to place us when and where that you placed us. The exact timing of our birth, the exact place of our birth, Father, you know all. Father, I ask that you touch the hearts of everyone here today. Bring renewal and commitment or recommitment to you, dear Lord. Let us truly search after you and seek after you with all of our hearts, all of our minds, and soul, and might. Let us not put anything before you in any high place, but let you be most high in our lives and let us serve you. Father, if there be anyone here today that does not receive you as their Lord and Jesus Christ as their Savior, Lord, we ask that you touch their hearts today and you draw them to you. If there be anyone here today who is being drawn, called by the Spirit of God and want to receive him as your personal Lord God, as your provider, as your source, as your protector, I just want you to slip your hand up and I want to pray for you afterward. Let not it wait for tomorrow. Let's not delay. Receive the Lord as your Savior today. If this is you, just slip your hand up. Father, I pray that the words spoken would bring forth good fruit in the hearts and minds of everyone here today. That they will not leave here the same. That they will leave here with a new appreciation of who you are. That they will be convicted and that they would be renewed in their spirit. That they would recommit their lives to serving you. And put that fire in their hearts to serve you, to fellowship with you, to pray, to read your word and to bear fruit for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things.